A new hero arrives in the Sword Coast and he is blessed with superhuman abilities. He'll use his legs of steel to jump his way past enemies, his sheer willpower to resist their curses, and his unfailing sense of justice to protect those in need, all on tactician difficulty. But before that, the rules. Rule number one. No other party members that have their own detached portrait, summons, and temporary companions such as Sovereign Glut are A-OK. -okay. Number two. No multi-classing. We're monk and nothing but monk. Number three. No using illithid powers whatsoever, since I want to show off just how cool monks can be on their own. Number four. No respecking. We gotta plan out our build well, and any mistakes in that process we're gonna stick with. Number five. No barrelmancy. That includes chestmancy to block doorways and other such nonsense too. Number six, no saving in the middle of combat. We're gonna have to work for our victories. Number seven, no karmic dice. This is to make the combat more of an authentic D&D experience and get true RNG. And finally, number eight, no changing the difficulty at any point. This is a tactician run, after all. As a side note real quick, these videos take a ton of effort to make, so I'd really appreciate it if you hit the like and subscribe buttons. But with that out of the way, on to character creation. For this run, we'll be going as a Wood Elf for the extra weapon proficiencies and the bonus 5 feet of move speed. The extra skill proficiencies, immunity to magical sleep, and dark vision are all some nice bonuses too. You all voted on the class that we were going for this playthrough, and as I'm sure you figured out by now, we're going to be going as a monk. Still, there's not a lot of choices for us to make at first level, so moving on. Our background of choice is Folk Hero, to really fit with the symbol of justice we will no doubt become. We make our ability scores look a little something like this, with a focus on dexterity and wisdom in particular since our AC scales with both thanks to unarmored defense. And our skill proficiencies get sorted out a moment later, and we're looking pretty well-rounded thanks to our bonus racial skills. Then we make our superhero look reticle, that's a portmanteau of red and radical for the uninitiated, and to cap it all off we give our brand new hero a name befitting an elf of his stature, one that will sound through all Faerun. All villains will fear the name Thelonious Monkfisto. Our speedy savior begins his nautiloid escape after having been captured by some malicious mind flayers who implanted an illithid tadpole in his brain. Naturally, he's gotta find a way to get rid of it, but first he's gotta escape. Along our way out of here we encounter Lazelle, a wannabe sidekick, but we explain that the hero life is dangerous and she graciously understands and jumps off the edge of the ship. With our first innocent, um, uh, saved, we clean up this first fight no problem with just a few thwacks and wax. Then we're off to the helm to try and commandeer the vehicle. There's a bit of a fight going on here already, but we want nothing to do with this. So we beat up some of the little henchmen for a bit of extra XP, grab some void bulbs, and grab the transponder for some good old tentacly fun. Unfortunately, this causes the ship to crash, and we awaken on the beach below feeling a wee bit wobbly, but there's evil to vanquish, so we set out. And as soon as we set out, we find a really cool hat, I mean look at it. But more importantly, we find some really uncool villainy in the form of a couple intellect devourers, though we do get a surprise round on them and they go down without a problem. Then we deliver a swift mercy kill to this poor unfortunate soul and do a bit of sightseeing for some more experience. This is enough to grant us level 2. With level 2 we gain an extra key point as we will every level. Unarmored movement for 3 meters of even more move speed so long as we're not wearing armor or a shield, and we also get patient defense, step of the wind dash, and step of the wind disengage, which give us a variety of ways to use key points and bonus actions, though we won't be using any of these a ton. Feeling faster and more powerful than ever, we continue our journey and find a scary pack of goblins wreaking havoc on the locals. Naturally, we jump in to help. This fight really isn't a problem for us. The goblins pretty much get bullied throughout the full duration of it by both the locals and Thelonious himself. And before you know it, the whole fight gets cleaned up without a single one of the good guys going down, which is a pretty good start if you ask me. Once inside, we roll up to a bit of an argument going on, so we do what any good Samaritan would do and knock out one of the stressed and potentially traumatized people. To settle things, of course. We do a bit of meandering at this point too. We inspire some more folks with our wise words, meet an innocent old lady who sells us a cool staff, find a hidden thieves guild run by children who ask us to steal a shiny idol for them, and we also save a child from just the worst woman who is somehow in charge of this place. We find evidence of her misdeeds, the woman, not the child, and get asked by Zevlor to kill the nearby goblin leaders. Oh boy, that's a lot to do. While Thelonious tries to get started on his list of tasks, he gets quickly interrupted by our first major supervillain, Raphael, who doesn't even try and hide how evil he is, 
but we tell him to bugger off because we've got things to do. After heading inside a nearby cave, we stumble upon a man in need who's been knocked out by a group of goblins. We get to rescuing him, and I mean, it's a pack of goblins, what do you expect? They each go down in a couple hits. How hard can they be? Hi, uh, okay, well, he, he just got lucky. Let's give that one another go. What the heck, another crit? From the same guy? Okay, I see you, Warrior Gresh. I'll play it safe next time. Good lord, that wasn't even a crit that time. It's fine, we're fine. Maybe <laughs> maybe this guy's the real supervillain. Either way, we finally take him out next to Samp, and let's agree to just scrub this one from the records. To reward ourselves for defeating this great evil, we don a beautiful cape that at the very least makes us feel faster, if nothing else. I mean, look at the Thelonious go. And as further reward, we get to pet the best boy too. Then we're off to the Blighted Village, where we find someone breaking the law via public intoxication, so we make sure that they learn their lesson, and we convince the local goblins that we belong so no funny business happens. Well, here we also grab the Haste Helm, which gives us momentum for 3 turns at the start of each combat, and momentum is an extra 1.5 meters of movement per turn remaining. This will really help us close any gaps to our enemies when a fight starts. And for tricking the goblins, we also got enough experience for level 3. This is our much-awaited subclass level where we go way of the open hand, granting us a bunch of different variants to our flurry of blows, allowing us to knock enemies prone, push them back, or prevent them from making attacks of opportunity. And we also get Deflect Missiles, which allow us to use our reaction to reduce range damage by a bit, with the option of throwing it back at the enemies for a key point. To top it off, our Martial Arts die increases to a D6 instead of a D4, which means more damage on our unarmed attacks. Returning to our misadventures, we head into the basement of the Apothecary, where we find the Bracers of Defense. These bad boys grant us an extra plus 2 to our AC so long as we're not wearing armor or a shield. Survivability is insanely important for us as a lone wolf character, so these fellas will be our most used gloves for a while to come. Now that we're a little more juiced up, we decide to head back to the crypt near the beginning and see if there's any sentient undead that have power over life or death waiting to be woken from their long rest. Along the way, we crush some nefarious ne'er-do-wells with a large rock, show off our impeccable new skills, and show a wizard how a staff is really meant to be used. Thelonious heads inside and finds some other criminal cretins lurking about, but is nothing a good thwack? Explosive destructive ordinance that rips limb from body in horrific burning pain? And whack, can't fix. Then we head deeper inside and find a room full of skeletons, and just in case they rise to fight us, we make sure to take their weapons from them beforehand, as well as cast protection from evil and good with a scroll. We press an ominous looking button, and sure enough, our calcium dependent foes rise to give one last fight. This fight is quite a breeze thanks to our main damage source being bludgeoning, and all these dudes have vulnerability to it. It does get a tad scary for a moment when the first instance of damage causes us to lose our concentration, but just to be safe, we recast it on our next turn and heal up. From there, the fight goes nice and smoothly, with the skeletons doing their best impressions of dominoes and falling one by one. And what a coincidence, wouldn't you know it? There's a sentient undead who has power over life or death who is also waiting to be woken from their long rest just hanging out back here. And he's so grateful to us that he decides to just stalk us in our camp from now on. Our heroics for the day aren't done yet, though. We're back to the Blighted Village, and the goblins here are torturing a deep gnome in need. So we tell them they gotta go, either the easy way or the hard way. The head honcho gets a good sniff of us and knows we mean business, so he decides to head out. Another innocent rescued, and we're moving on to the goblin camp. Along the way, there's a checkpoint with a few henchmen, but we help them realize that it's in the best interest of their bones to let us through, and we arrive at the camp proper a moment later. Once inside, we meet up with Priestess Gut, one of the goblin leaders, and we convince her to wait for us somewhere a little bit more private, and she happily obliges. But before we get to that, we swing by this gentleman, who offers to give us some penance and see how tough our bod is. Thelonious is not one to pass up the opportunity to show off his super bod, so we give it a whirl. And when all is said and done, and we've given this fella an experience that was positively divine, we get Leviatar's Love, a permanent buff that gives us plus 2 to attacks and saving throws well below 30% HP. Not always helpful, but nice in a pinch. Then we head to the next room, take out the guard inside, and free Volo, everybody's favorite wizard who would really love to catch up with us, but would prefer to do so at our camp and not inside a goblin fortress. Unfortunately, our conversation gets cut a bit short by a couple of goblins stumbling upon us, but hey, it wouldn't be an infiltration mission if we didn't have to stash a few bodies in some closets. 
Now that we're done everything else we need to in the goblin camp, we meet up with the priestess, lure her over to the edge, and try and shove her off. And it just doesn't work. Like, she failed the saving throw and everything. I'm still pretty miffed about this because it resulted in us getting another death too, but we try again with a regular shove and that doesn't work either, and neither does a void bulb, so I, I don't know, maybe you just can't shove her. Either way, our main goal for now is to get into her private quarters, so we just pick the lock head inside, and tiptoe past Gut's gal pal that just so happens to live in her bedroom. And at the back of the room, there's a secret passageway that plunges into the cavernous depths of the world that lurks below us, and so Thelonious descends. Once in the Underdark, we find a hella cool sword, and after giving it a bit of a blood sacrifice, it decides to join us as our long-term weapon. This sword is of course Falara Louvre, a plus one longsword that has the ability to either shriek or sing for five turns once per short rest as an action. If you choose to shriek, all nearby enemies take a 1d4 penalty to their mental saves and take an extra 1d4 thunder damage per hit. And if you choose to sing, all nearby allies get a 1d4 bonus to their mental saves as well as a 1d4 bonus to attack rolls. This sword is crazy good for builds that are planning on hitting a whole lot thanks to its shriek, and as a monk we're going to be hitting enemies a ton. As a side note, normally we wouldn't get proficiency with this weapon since it's a longsword, but that's why we chose Wood Elf. Nice and nearby is the Myconid Colony, a town full of fungal folks and folks in need. One such folk indeed is just a folk in need of an antidote, and upon giving it to her, she rewards us with the Boots of Speed. These boots let us click our heels as a bonus action, which lets us dash and give all enemies disadvantage on opportunity attacks against us. Nothing fancy, but not having to spend a key point to do this is phenomenal for us, so we'll be sticking with these for a little while. She also lets us know that her kin are being enslaved by the not-so-neighborly Dwergar, which isn't relevant quite just yet, but keep it in mind. Thelonious's citizen in need senses get tingling though, and we find a dwarf in deep doo-doo nearby and toss him a scroll of Misty Step to save him. Then we meet some incredibly speedy ogres who are honestly quite the inspiration for us. Don't worry, we'll be that fast very soon. Especially come level 4. With this level up we get Slow Fall, which grants us resistance to fall damage as a reaction, but more importantly we also get our first feat. We choose Mobile for this go around, and before you say it, I know the optimal build is to use Tavern Brawler and Strength Elixirs, but since I used that already in my fighter run, which you should really check out, I decided to mix it up. Mobile grants us an extra 3 meters of move speed, which totals us up to a metric boatload, as well as makes it so when we dash difficult terrain doesn't affect us. But above all, it makes it so when we attack an enemy, they can no longer opportunity attack us for the rest of the turn, allowing for insane hit and run tactics. With our dash and boots of speed, our camera can barely pan far enough to keep up with our move speed. That's the good stuff, alright. Thelonious uses his immense speed to zoom down to the nearby swamp where he finds a couple young men yelling at that nice old lady from earlier, so he heroically mows them down with his cool new sword. And, oh my, the lady just disappeared in a heinous puff of smoke. Oh well, that's a later problem. For now, we head deeper into the swamp to finally grab that evidence to prove Kaga, the evil druid lady, is in fact evil. But there's a lot of scary dudes, so we just use a scroll of invisibility and a potion of glorious vaulting to sneak in. We grab the proof that we need and fast travel out to safety. Before we confront Kaga, we down an elixir of heroism just in case things get rough. Once we do confront her, we find out that the friggin' rats were secretly her henchmen in disguise, and there's some heated moments as the other druids grapple with this betrayal. But we've learned from the best of the heroes, and we're able to talk some sense into Kaga and rally her onto our side for the ensuing fight. When the fight does start, the enemies are outnumbered 2 to 1, and all our worry and preparation was a little bit overkill, as none of our guys go down, even despite walking through friendly moonbeams. All the rat folk go down easy though. We don't get the hero's reward we clearly deserve, so afterwards we take matters into our own hands by yoinking the idol of Sylvanas since they don't really need it anymore anyways. And we turn it into the tiefling kids for our first major ring, the Ring of Protection. This little fella gives us a plus one to both our AC and saving throws. Not a wild effect, but I have a hard time imagining any other ring we'd rather have. Now that we're properly kitted out, we head back to take the goblin leaders on properly, starting with Priestess Gut. With Shriek active, we enter turn-based mode, making a swing at her, which unfortunately is a crit miss, followed by a flurry of blows for a second crit miss, and then a crit hit, which is all sorts of emotionally confusing. And unfortunately, we're just shy of finishing her off the next turn, which means she gets to alert the entire rest of the camp to our presence. So on our next turn, we finish her off and use our mad move speed to get out of dodge and head straight to bed to refresh our resources. Our rest is not so restful though, as the next morning Volo says he can help us out with our tadpole problem, and with a little tap, tap, stab, 
We end up losing an eye. He is nice enough to give us a replacement that lets us see invisible things though, which, you know what, that counts as a new superpower in my books. And now it's time to clear out the rest of the goblins. We head back out and start by burning this war drum so they'll have a harder time calling for reinforcements. Then we fire a shot from stealth to start initiative. On our first turn we just shut this door and skedaddle into a corner where it'll hopefully be hard to hit us. Most of the enemies spend their turns dashing around the place with the exception of this cleric who casts Bless. Thelonius completely whiffs his next turn and fails to kill an archer in melee range which is just disappointing, honestly. And the most fearsome of the enemies is quickly revealed to be Roa Moonglow, a merchant who has no qualms using her own merchandise to cast as many spells as she can in one turn. Unfortunately, we manage to aggro a warlock on the opposite side of the camp somehow, and he bangs away on the war drum over there to alert more folks too. But on the bright side, the merchant and her cronies take this opportunity to dip, so it's just goblins we're worrying about. And as scary as the action economy looks, most of the enemies are clerics who prefer to heal than hurt, and archers who are prone to having their missiles deflected. All we need to do is actually hit the enemies, which is apparently easier said than done. Once we do start hitting, it gets a bit easier, but just to be on the safe side, we use a scroll of blur and then slowly start whittling away at the enemies one by one. We do take the odd hit now and then, and we start burning through our healing potion supply as a result. Until we finally manage to take out the last of them, but it's become clear we're having a ton of problems hitting enemies. We sneak up on another group of foes and we take out their war drum to start off too. And it's in this fight we really get to show off what we're capable of. With the mobile feet we can just swing at them and whether or not we hit we use our mad move speed to get out of reach, forcing them to dash up to us and waste their action. We just rinse and repeat for the whole encounter and take them out no problem while getting our cardio in. It's honestly kind of satisfying seeing them scamper on over to us just for them to face Thelonious at the end. After they're all dealt with, we go back to pick off the stragglers who didn't get pulled into the fight. And on this bozo's turn, he turns the corner and aggros the nearby Minthara. Thankfully, she spends her turn moving right onto the very breakable bridge, so when it comes to us, we can just use our bonus action to click our heels, activating our boots, and move into bowshot range, taking her out before she can even do anything. And that's the second major villain down. This goblin gets really pissed about it. What a devoted henchman. The others go down soon after, with some help from our arachnid allies below. With just one of the treacherous trio remaining, we sneak up to the rafters and start off by shooting a flaming brazier onto the unsuspecting goons. Then we zoom out of the room, way out of reach of the enemies, so that they all have to dash up to us. And as we fall into our usual rhythm for this fight, we find out that Dror Ragslin has got mad hops, which is a little worrisome, but should be fine. On our turn, we use Falara Lube Singing to try and boost our attack rolls, since our chance to hit is abysmal, but we find out it's just completely busted, and despite saying it gives a 1d4 bonus, it actually just doesn't. Well, nothing to do for it. Our hero tries to flurry of blows push him off the edge, but the second attack misses, which is the only one that triggers the push, so we just scamper away. Thankfully, we force Papa Ragslin to dash anyways, and oh, oh my god, I, I honestly had no idea he could do that. But don't you worry, Mr. Monkfisto has one last trick up his sleeve. With a potion of flying, we zoom out of the pit, and now we're faster than ever before. There's not much the enemies can do from this point, as we just swing at them, and then travel to another zip code every turn. And to make matters worse for the goblins, this spider decides to just phase out of its prison and start wreaking a bit of carnage on its own. Just a few more rounds of bullying Dror and his gang, and the heinous hobgoblin goes down for the count. Once we're done inside, we've got one last thing left to do on the outside. We prep up with Falara Luv's Shriek and step into a veritable horde. Thankfully, we're only here for one of them, Crusher. We zoom on over to him on our first turn just to have him belt us with rocks, which don't count as missiles for deflect missiles purposes, and take some blows from other dudes too. So on our next turn, we down a potion of speed, disengage, fail a swing, and start zooming to the high ground. Crusher follows us up unknowing that this was our goal all along, and we're able to finish him off next turn with a lucky few hits. We take what we need from his corpse and zoom away before the other goblins can fathom what just happened. Our reward for this assassination is Crusher's ring and the feeling of a job well done. The feeling isn't worth much, but the ring grants us an extra 3 meters of move speed, since we obviously needed to be even faster. From here we use our newly improved speed to run to the mountain pass, where we meet Lady Esther. We talk to her, do a little bit of shopping, and find out she wants us to kidnap an unhatched Githyanki egg from the nearby crash. Between this and her absolutely criminal prices, we decide to stop her before her evil plan can come to fruition, and we get some pretty good loot from her. 
The main two items we get from her are the gloves of Cinder and Sizzle and the graceful cloth. The gloves let us cast Scorching Ray once per long rest and also give our unarmed attacks an extra 1d4 fire damage. We'll still mainly be sticking with our bracers of defense, but we'll throw these on now and then when we deem the extra damage more important. And the cloth grants us advantage on all dex checks, resistance for fall damage, bonus jump distance, a plus one to our dex saving throws, and most importantly increases our dexterity score by two, bumping us up to 19 currently. Then we're back to the Underdark, and finally taking on the Dwergar near the Mykonid colony. We bring Sovereign Glut with us for some added back up too. On our first turn, we get a killer push on one of the guys, sending him to an early grave, before almost getting our feet blasted off by another dude who is more than okay blowing himself up. Glut goes down as per usual just a few turns later, and we're left alone, which means it's back to maximum kiting. I'll speed this one up for you, cause it is a doozy. We end up luring the Dwergar all the way back to the Mykonid colony, hoping that they'll help us kill their sworn enemies, but they don't really care all that much. Regardless, we just run in loops around the colony as we slowly beat up the remaining baddies until they're entirely drained of resources and just stand there as we shoot them down. We tell Sovereign Spa the good news once we're done, because apparently he didn't see it happen like right next to him, and he gives us our next supervillain, Nier, a mean little drow dude who lives just across the lake. And he gives us some bliss spores to help us deal with him, which gives us an extra 1d6 on basically every roll until our next long rest. Before we go deal with all that though, we notice we're awfully close to level 5, so we head back to the crush real quick and commit some mild cobalt genocide to get that sweet level up. With level 5, we gain an increased proficiency bonus, up to plus 3, as well as the extra attack and stunning strike features. Extra attack grants us one more attack each turn, and stunning strike lets us expend a key point to try and stun an enemy for one round. If it succeeds, you can get some crazy stun locks going, but either way, with all these bonuses, we're feeling much stronger. Now that we're level 5, we cross the lake, and it's here we meet a couple of Dwergar that seem a little miffed about Nier being in charge. They let us know if we take out the scrying eye nearby, they'll help us in the coming battle. We need all the help we can get. So we pop the eye, head over to where the gnomes mentioned earlier are slaving away trying to free Nier from a cave-in, and pop that bad boy open too. He comes sauntering out and yeets a slave straight into the lava as we kinda just watch with a dumb little look on our face, and then a fight breaks out. We jump into action, sending one of the bozos into the lava. <laughs> That's what you get for standing so close. Then we pass the turn to our enemies and- wait, 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 no, 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 wait, 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 oh, okay. Yeah, that's, that's my bad. We jump into action, sending one of the bozos into the lava before running up onto the high ground and wailing on this archer. Carnage reigns in this fight as bolts go flying, people get bashed, Nier takes care of his friends, and then he gets stunned by our brand new ability. Some allies go down, a couple dudes shrink themselves, but we don't have to stress too much when we've got so many friends on our side. One of them is even nice enough to take out the head honcho for us. A moment later, and the last goon goes down too. We make a check to scare off the Dwergar who helped us and properly free the slaves, causing the legend of Thelonious Monk Fisto to only grow larger. We hop down the path a little bit more, grab a goofy amulet that helps us restore our key, bully some sentient suits of armor, then we head down to the Grimforge proper to take out a construct we hear has been terrorizing the locals. Thelonious spins the valve and out pops Grim, a powerful metal guardian who thinks he's tough enough to take on our speedster. Now, Grim has vulnerability to bludgeoning damage while superheated by the lava, and well, there's a perfectly good massive forge hammer in the center of the arena, who needs that when we've got fists of steel? So, as an added challenge, we decide to take this fight on without the hammer. Our first attempt goes phenomenally. We land blow after blow, ticking down Grim's health, and while we do get dangerously low at some points, we make our saving throws when it counts. And thanks to our step of the wind making it so jumping doesn't require a bonus action, we can always hop out of trouble if we really need to. That is, until we try and hop past Grim, and the game just glitches out and we clothesline ourselves, falling into the lava and we die a burning death. I, um, I don't even know what to say. Our next attempt doesn't go so cool either, when we get hit by the old slam into quake combo by Grim taking us out from full health. Third time is the charm though, but before we go in, we do a bit more prep. We swap out our boost for the disintegrating nightwalkers, which let us misty step once as a bonus action. Our weapon for Corellan's grace, which gives us a bonus to unarmed attacks and saving throws. And we cast enlarge on ourselves with a spell scroll for extra damage and advantage on strength saves. And we top it off with an elixir of heroism for a 1d4 bonus to attacks and saves. As the fight starts, we're off to the races. We whiff a flurry of blows to try and topple Grim, and whiff with our topple staff attack too, before moving to the other side of the platform. Next turn, we find out the hard way the big guy is immune to being stunned, and we just jump on over to the other platform, but not far enough, as we still get attacked. 
We learn from our mistakes though, and after a few more whacks, we move our max distance, which is just enough to avoid a hit. The lava drains, and Thelonious is able to knock Grim prone with a flurry of blows before moving to the other side of the arena and shooting the valve with an arrow to bring back the heat. From here, we've learned the trick is to just hit a couple times and then run away as far as we can, saving our bonus action to jump. But the construct catches on and knocks us down with a quake, which also breaks our concentration. But we've been saving some key points just for this. With a little step of the wind dash, we get as many hops as we need to get to safety and heal up. These quakes are really starting to mess us up though, especially since we lose half our movement just standing up each turn, so we resort to throwing down a potion of speed and running away. The relentless pursuit continues though, as we fail saving throw after saving throw, so we heal up, punch a little bit, and misty step to the other side of the arena, which causes Grim to saunter over to the center. We use our last key point to dash and gain infinite jumps for this turn so that we can jump up to Grim, deliver three attacks, one of which is a crit, and intentionally save one so that after we do a half circuit of the arena, we still have one action left to throw down a speed pot. One more turn goes by and Thelonious gets another full round of blows against the big guy, but things get dire when Grim knocks us down with another stomp. Our last turn of speed potions has come upon us, and our foe still has a ton of health left. There's nothing we can do but believe, and the belief pays off when we get a huge crit, followed by a hit, and another hit, and one final punch to finish off this criminal construct. We don't really get a reward for this one since the adamantine gear is pretty useless for us, but man did that feel good. Just a few more things to do before we're done with Act 1, and first on that list is making sure the old lady in the swamp is doing well, and uh, oh, oh no, I um... Man, how did our villain senses miss this one? Well, a fight starts with her and her garden gnomes, but she just runs away. And the garden gnomes, or redcaps if you prefer, go down pretty easily. If these are her goons, she's probably a massive pushover herself. Then we're down to the basement where Ethel tries to put the moves on us before we stumble across a room filled with poor innocents being mind controlled by her. Thelonious knows the right thing to do is to put them out of their misery, so we activate Falara Luf's shriek and run into combat. This fight really ain't too bad if you ignore the one round where we get knocked down to literally 1 HP after getting hit by every enemy, but soon after we take out the first of them and they don't really have the damage to kill us. Sure enough, they're down in a matter of moments and that's more innocence saved by our hero. Before we take on the horrible hag herself, we prepare by downing an elixir of poison resistance, casting protection from evil and good, coating our sword in drow poison, and drinking a potion of invisibility. Then we sneak in, rescue Marina while invisible, use Volo's eye to find the invisible Ethel, and start to wail away at her, with a stunning strike which also puts her to sleep, causing a really awkward series of events, but eventually the fight starts. Ethel conjures up all her clones, and I'm not gonna lie, this fight just doesn't go well for us. We barely do any damage before we get hold personed, and shortly thereafter, brutally bashed. With the resources we had on hand, this fight was real rough, and it took something crazy like 7 attempts. On one attempt, we used a scroll of Wall of Fire to take Ethel below her health threshold, which resulted in Mayrina instantly dying, because apparently the cutscene teleports her to that part of the map specifically. Another go around, we summoned the Ogres, which I also wouldn't recommend, since one of them went very far out of his way to kill Mayrina. The attempt that finally makes it work isn't even that remarkable, we just roll higher in initiative and hit her with a stunning strike. And then the next turn, we hit her with another one. And another one after that. And that's how you do it, apparently. Ethel surrenders and offers us power in exchange for letting her go with Mayrina. Naturally, we'd like to save the girl, but, uh, well, you know, this power will probably help us save more people. Sorry, Mayrina. Catch you on the flip side. For our power up, we gain an extra permanent plus one to our dexterity, bumping it up to 20 and our modifier to a plus five. Now we've got one last thing to do before we head to Act 2. The Githyanki crash has been causing carnage for the locals. It's up to us to take them out. We head inside and convince them to take us to their leader relatively easily. Once we meet said leader, he begins to ask us about the astral prism. We reveal it and, oh boy, the supervillain senses are just going crazy when this big old lady shows up. She demands we go inside the prism and kill our dream visitor. We play along, cause, you know, we don't want to die. We meet up with our dream visitor and, oh, oh my god, I forgot they looked like that. Uh, anyways, we have a quick chat with them and get ready to head back out. We've already got an elixir of bloodlust going, as well as a bless from our dream visitor. We stack up a few more buffs with the drow poison and shriek from our sword. The fight starts and we've got a plan. We start by throwing a potion of speed at the ground. Then we go straight for one of the ardents with a topple since they're the most dangerous by far. It lands and we finish them off with a couple swings from our sword. 
Then we run over to the other one, hitting them with our third action, whereupon the poison knocks him out, granting us a free crit followed up by a regular hit to finish them off. After all that, we still have movement to get relatively behind cover. On our next turn, we swing at the big guy to avoid opportunity attacks, then we use our step of the wind dash so we can jump up and zoom up to the crossbow guy on the high ground, finishing them off in just a few swings, but unfortunately not triggering our elixir because they died to our shriek aura. But Thelonious is a speedy guy and bunny hops to the other alcove for safety. Trust me, this is the fastest way to move. The enemies do their best to reach us to no avail, and on our next turn we get a good couple whacks before running away and refreshing our speed pot. The last henchman gets a killer hit on us that leaves us dazed, reeling, and about to break, but we finish her off in retaliation. With just what Wargaz left, it's hit and run for days, and he just does not have the stuff to keep up with us. And before you know it, the last major fight of Act 1 is down easy peasy. We fight our way past the rest of the warriors waiting for us outside, and manage to eke out one more level up from Act 1. Level 6 grants us another 1.5 meters of unarmored movement. Key Empowered Strikes, which lets our unarmed attacks count as magical for resistance purposes. Manifestation of Mind, Body, or Soul, which lets us add 1d4 plus Wisdom, Psychic, Necrotic, or Radiant damage respectively to our unarmed strikes. As well as Wholeness of Body, which once per long rest as an action restores half of our key points, and for the next three turns we gain an extra bonus action, as well as one key point at the start of each turn. This level is such an insane offensive power spike for us, and I'm really looking forward to seeing how it performs in the next act. With that, we're all done with Act 1, and we head to the exit in Grimforge to enter the Shadow Cursed Lands, where there will no doubt be many more people in need of saving. Our journey continues in the Shadow Cursed Lands, and as our hero enters, we're immediately afflicted by the titular Shadow Curse itself. To stave it off, we need to ensure we keep a light source on us until we find a more permanent way to deal with it, so goodbye Falara Louvre, and hello Torch. A moment later, we come across some harpers meandering through the darkness and get into a bit of a staring contest as our heroic reputation no doubt stuns them into silence. Unfortunately, we're interrupted by some scumbag shadows and our first fight of the act kicks off. Before we can even get a turn, one of the shadows gets us with a strength train, causing us to take a bit of damage and, surprise surprise, lose some strength. After a bit of inventory management, we start off with a flurry of blows, and thanks to our new feature granting bonus radiant damage on our attack, it one-shots a shadow due to their vulnerability. And since we're showing off new features, we also use wholeness of body, granting us an extra bonus action. Then we follow it up with another flurry of blows, taking out yet another shadow in one go. The sketchy shades spend their turns wagging around our allies as our allies whack back on theirs. And before you know it, it's back to Thelonious, where we start running around the area delivering flurry of blows followed by flurry of blows taking out two more shadows, then using our action to throw down a potion, healing both ourselves and an ally. Our sidekicks manage to take out their reanimated pal, and a shadow swoops in while they're distracted to clobber us up a little bit more. We quickly retaliate, finishing it off with the old 1-2, and jog across the battlefield to get the other one as well. The Harpers then tell us about a safe haven nearby where there's plenty more folks in need, so we zip on over there. Upon arriving at the last light in, we meet Jahira, a fellow powerful hero from a bygone age, but she does doesn't trust us all that much. Thankfully, one of the innocents we had rescued previously speaks up for us and gets us inside. Once on the inn's grounds, we head straight to Quartermaster Tally, who loads us up with the Cloak of Protection and the Amulet of the Harpers. The Cloak of Protection does the same as our ring, granting a further plus one to both AC and saving throws, while the Amulet of the Harpers lets us cast shield once per long rest, as well as gives us advantage on all wisdom saving throws. Both of these items are pretty killer boosts to our survivability, but we're not done with getting new items quite just yet. We head over to everyone's favorite supersmith Damon and grab the Darkfire Shortbow. This plus two shortbow grants us resistance to fire and cold damage, as well as lets us cast haste once per long rest. The resistances are a nice boost, but the real treat is being able to cast haste. We won't do it often since our concentration saves are terrible, but it's still a nice thing to have just in case. And we're still not done. Now we're off to Mattis, where we get some evasive shoes, giving us yet another plus one to our AC and a nice little plus one to our acrobatics to boot pun intended. Of course, this does mean farewell to our boots of speed, but at this point we're plenty fast as is and have tons of other uses for our bonus actions. Now that we've gotten all our items in order, we set about saving all the people here, since while they may have many heroes amongst their ranks, they're in need of a superhero. So we talk to Jahira and learn the supervillain in charge of everything wrong here is Catherick Thorm, who's hanging out at Moonrise Towers. She also tells us to go talk to Isabel upstairs who can bless us, but we'll save that for later since our 
villain senses start to tingle whenever we head up the stairs. On our way out of town, we meet up with some more harpers who let us know they've got an ambush set up on some cruel cultist convoy that's got a way of resisting the curse, and they want us to join. The Lonius never scoffs at a chance to take out villainy, so we follow them, get in position, and signal our allies to attack. The fight starts, and unfortunately, the Drider goes first, and, and oh my god. Uh, well, surely that won't set a precedent for the rest of the fight, right? Okay, so that's not great, it's just us left, but we'll be in a way safer spot if we just knock the Drider off the edge, we'll move slightly to the side of the Drider, and... Ugh. Okay. Attempt two, here we come. Before our second go around, we prep by drinking a bloodlust elixir just to be sure. The fight starts much the same way as attempt one, with another instant crit taking out one of our pals. But on our turn, we run down, and with a flurry of blows as well as a good old stab, we take out one of the henchmen, and get a good couple of swings on another one on our way back up to the building. Our plan to eventually pivot up to the roof gets blown when one of the goons yeets a bomb at an ally, breaking both ladders. Our allies wail on the baddies a bit and get wailed on quite a bit more in turn. When it's back to us, we try and take out another one of the little guys to trigger our elixir, but a crit miss causes us to pivot our turn and jump up onto the roof to heroically wait out till the next round. Unfortunately, our allies didn't think to do the same, and they start getting a wee bit cooked, as well as slashed to bits for that matter. A round or two goes by without much interesting happening, just a bit of back and forth between us and the enemies. Spider-Man hops onto the roof to start swinging away at us, and now we're in the end game. We use a stunning strike to take the fellow out of the fight for one more round, and follow it up with a flurry of blows to try and shove him off the roof, which unfortunately misses. The Wicked Wizard summons a cloud of daggers on our last remaining pal before just running into it himself, which is an interesting strategy, I'll give him that. Thanks to his health being lowered, we get to finish off the foolish foe on our turn with a couple good stabs and a solid thwack. With the extra action we get from our elixir, we cast haste on ourselves, which gives us yet another action to hamstring shot the drider in an attempt to slow it down, which fails, as well as stunning strike it, which also fails, so we settle for just running to the far side of the roof. The remaining goon continues to do, um, things on his turn, and the drider misses us with a swipe. Thelonious uses his masterful speed to swing away at the drider, starting to chip away at his health and failing to push it off the roof with another flurry of blows. So we keep playing keep away and just skedaddle to the far side of the roof yet again. Afterwards, the barbarian baddie below finally catches on and hops up to our bereaved bowman buddy up above to finish him off. We get the urge to become some sort of uh, avenger, so we swing at the drider to prevent attacks of opportunity thanks to our feet and then run over to the barbarian to deliver a series of swings and take him out. Thelonious is right his rampage isn't over yet though. With a few more swings on the drider, we continue to chip away at it, and our stupendous speed allows us to move far enough away that our eight-legged foe has to dash and waste its turn to reach us. After rinsing and repeating the old hit and run strat for a few turns, we finally manage to use a flurry of blows to push the drider off the roof. I mean, he's dead before he even hits the ground, but it still counts. With the drider dead and gone, we're able to yoink his moon lantern and free the pixie trapped inside, and as a reward for another heroic deed, she gives us a blessing that lets us resist the shadow curse for good. Now that we're free to explore properly, we head towards the Sundered City nearby, and along the way we meet Garen Joe Thorm, who unfortunately isn't intimidated by our raw presence and decides to try and murder us. She misses both of her attacks on the first go around, and we take a swing at both her and the nearby goon, missing both but landing our second attack on the goon, switching our extra damage to Psychic, since they're vulnerable to that. We jog on up to the top of the roof, and the baddies all spend their turns dashing on over to us. Jerry is nice enough to plop herself down right next to the edge of the roof, so we introduce her to the wonders of gravity which doesn't stop her from doing some good bad guy smack talking. Since we've got Falara Louvre back, we use its streak ability to start dealing extra damage and shimmy away so the hench skulls got a dash to keep up with us. From here, it's just a matter of taking out all the visages one by one with the old hit and run combo. With each one that falls, Jaren Goth has her max HP reduced by 100 as well. Let that be a lesson to all villains to not count on your goons too much. Poor Garen Gothi finally makes it back up right after the last visage goes down, letting us take her out with all the force of a light breeze. Thelonious heard Jerry wasn't the only Thorm haunting the time-torn town though, so we set out to track down the other wretched wrongdoers. Along the way we run into some loitering hoodlums in town square, when there's a very clear no loitering sign right next to them. So we show them what for nice and quick. Then we arrive at the House of Healing where we meet 
sister Cinda who tries to bar our passage, but that really doesn't go well for her. Once we've negotiated passage inside, we head to the auditorium where we meet the practicing Dr. Malice Thorm, who's in the middle of cutting up a living dude and saying just the most incomprehensible nonsense one could come up with. So we jump into action to defeat this sadistic surgeon and his ne'er-do-well nurses. We use our sword shriek and a flurry of blows on one of the nurses to dish out some damage before running away. And, uh, well, that's pretty much the whole fight if I'm being honest, since they have no ranged attacks, but we do learn the not-so-good doctor can resurrect his goons, which is little more than a mild inconvenience. Whenever we take out one of the sisters, we make sure to loot their weapons so they can't do anything once they're resurrected. And before you know it, we take out most of the nurses, and it's just us, the doctor, and two relatively harmless goons. So we get into a cycle of punching malice, moving around 14 meters away, which forces him to dash, and repeating. Our hits do not do a lot of damage though, especially our sword swings, so this one takes quite a while, but since we're basically immortal in this fight, Malice's malicious malpractice is eventually put to an end. Worth noting, we realized we were doing way more damage with our unarmed attacks compared to using any weapons, so we decided to ditch Flarlu from here on out. You served us well, old friend. Thelonius' extinction of the Thorn family line is put on hold for a moment as he goes to the local tavern to grab a drink and relax, but who should be behind the bar but this Bald Thorm. We managed to stomach his vile brew without dying, but unfortunately he isn't quite entertained by our past exploits and instead decides to get involved in one of our present exploits. Now, there's a bit of a problem with this fight. Thizzabald has complete immunity to all physical damage, unless you let him vomit on you three times, which deals an absurd amount of damage and only gets rid of the immunity for a couple turns. Pair that with an immense health pool to match his stature, and we're in a bit of a pickle. This fight will be hard enough just dealing with Thizzabald, so we decide to focus on taking out the bar's patrons who have sided with him first. On our next turn, we whack the big man himself, and since we deal radiant damage, that imbues his belly with a flaming brew, for some reason, which is honestly a pretty good thing thanks to our resistance. Then we continue our onslaught of the goons, all while playing keep away from the bartender. This goes on for a while and a half, but we take out all his henchmen without getting hit a single time. After that, we get into the real meat of the fight, which takes even longer since Thizzabald is completely immune to most of our damage. So, on one of our turns, we use an action to slap on the gloves of Cinder and Sizzle, giving us some added fire damage and keeping his brew the same element. We make a bit of a mistake when we stay too close and he vomits onto us, but our resistance keeps us alive. Well, he summons another annoying goon, only to make the exact same mistake next turn. Honestly, I have no idea what was going through my head at the time, but it was certainly something. We take out the new two goons with a couple flurries and heal ourselves up, before falling back into the rhythm of things. As the chase continues, we learn that not Knocking him prone doesn't give advantage on attacks, which is a bit of a bummer and seems very randomly inconsistent, but c'est la vie. Later in the fight to speed things up, quite literally, our hero casts haste on himself so he can do some truly crazy wailing on the big T. I failed my concentration check in real life pretty late into this slog and didn't move far enough yet again, causing us to get vomited on, which broke our concentration in-game, causing us to lose a turn, but it shouldn't be too bad because he's supposed to lose a turn too, right? Right game? Game? What are, you, what are you doing? Excuse me? Okay, uh, well, we're alive. Since we survived, we just punch the bloated barber's bartender, heal up using a potion, and get to safety where we start up our cycle all over again. But I promise we learned our lesson, and the rest of the fight goes smooth, and we take out the last of the Thorm mini-bosses just a few rounds later. And it only took us 35 rounds? Oh god. Well, I guess there's one more optional fight involving a Thorm. Time to finally have that long-awaited chat with Isabel. We head up to her room with an open and vulnerable balcony where she gives us a blessing that allows us to resist necrotic damage for the rest of the act. And oh hi Marcus. The fight starts and before Isabel even gets a turn she's paralyzed and soon after taken out with a crit. Uh, we count that as death and move on. Next attempt, she uses her tactical genius to provoke an attack of opportunity which paralyzes her yet again, and she's gone a moment later. Before attempt 3, we make sure everything's in order. Isabel's got protection from evil and good casted on her, and we're using an elixir of the Colossus for some extra damage, as well as the flawed Helldust gloves for some bonus necrotic damage, and the chance to bleed enemies on our unarmed attacks. 
Attempt numero tres begins and Marcus immediately breaks her concentration, followed up with a crit hit on Isabel, which is truly impressive. Thelonious is up next though and he goes full hero mode, throwing down a potion of speed on both ourselves and Isabel and recasting protection from evil and good on her before one-shotting one of our fiendish foes with one flurry and getting a good whack on another. Izzy actually takes a turn and even more surprisingly uses it to preserve herself, using a rush attack to escape her enemies without triggering attacks of opportunity, turning some of them, and healing herself to boot. Marcus even decides to just screw off, wanting nothing to do with an Isabel who's defending herself. When it gets back to us, we use all our offensive capabilities to take out two more winged horrors, and we're looking pretty good. Another round goes by with our favorite Selenite sidekick not just surviving, but being useful, and on our turn, we take out yet another winged horror before refreshing our potion of speed. With the bad guys fully focused on taking out the more unimportant people in this inn, we're pretty well set. We stunning strike Marcus next round as well as take out one more winged horror with our bow. And all we need is one more round after that to finish off both Marcus and the last remaining winged assailant. Third time's the charm indeed. Now that the town and inn are a bit more cleaned up, we had to go meet Papa Thorm himself, who's currently lounging big supervillain style while listening to a report. Things get pretty heated, and uh, ooh. I guess they didn't know he was immortal. That's on them, should have done their research. We head upstairs after Catherick storms off to his private patio to go sulk, and we go chat with Zarel, his right hand lady, who lets us know about another villain named Balthazar who could use some help in the Thor mausoleum nearby looking for a relic called the Night Song. So we zoom to the mausoleum where we run into the devil himself yet again, who continues to be blatantly villainous with his rhymes and casual conversation. He warns us of a devilish threat that lurks in the mausoleum, and we continue on. Once inside, we solve a puzzle totally on the first try, ignore the darkness on the ground that was always there, by just pressing a few buttons. The puzzle leads us into a hidden char gauntlet underground where we find another puzzle, and this one is as easy as approaching from the western, uh, I, I mean eastern side, and then pressing the button in the center. A little bit deeper inside the gauntlet, we find an invisible cloaker who is pretty okay with us just raining arrows into it, until it's not. Thankfully, is little more than a villain of the day, and it goes down in just a few hits. In the next room, we find some potty mouth skeletons being controlled by Balthazar. As we're chatting with them, the room starts quaking, and some undead Sharn and Justiciers show up to try and whoop our butts. Thelonious jumps into action and immediately takes out one of the portals that spawn more of them, thanks to their vulnerability to radiant damage. We whack one of the shadowy scoundrels too, making sure to use Psychic as our added damage since they reflect Radiant. And then take out yet another Umbral Tremor. Some reanimated reinforcements of ours come charging in from the next room as the Tremors summon even more Sharans and more Tremors appear too. Since the Justiciers are decently well matched with our skeletons, we get put on portal duty, taking out another two on our turn. The fight rages on while we wait for it to get back to our turn, with foes and allies each dealing hefty blows to each other. When it's back to us, we continue our portal genocide, kick a dude in the back of the head which triggers the elixir of bloodlust we'd taken earlier and gives us an extra action to take out the mega-sized portal in the center of the room. Some of our allies start to go down here, but we're not too worried since this is only a temporary team up anyways. Our turn goes by with our desire for complete portal destruction almost being fully quenched. Just one left. Our skeletal sidekicks are really getting overwhelmed now, but we'll be helping them out soon, I promise. We finish off one of the dudes right next to us at the start of our turn, triggering our elixir and then taking out the last portal with a couple more punches. Okay, scratch the helping our allies statement from earlier, they're all dead, or like super dead now. Just us and six enemies left. One of them gets taken out with a flurry of blows, and another one goes down on our same turn to four good punches to the throat. They actually do have some ranged capabilities, so we can only outrun them so much, but since if push comes to shove we can deflect their attacks, we just focus on taking out some more of the melee guys for now before running away, naturally. Sure enough, push comes to shove on the next barrage, but we deflect it and take zero damage, followed up by punching the poor fool sprinting around trying to keep up with us. Rinse and repeat for a few turns and we manage to take out the melee guy, and shortly after the two crossbowmen as well. During the fight, we hit level 7, which is a bit of a mixed bag. We get evasion and stillness of mind. Evasion is a fantastic passive ability that makes it so whenever we're affected by something that has us do a dexterity save, we take zero damage on a success instead of half, and even if we fail, we still only take half damage. On the other hand, stillness of mind makes it so whenever we're frightened or charmed, we automatically use our action to remove the condition, and this passive is not toggleable. 
which means a lot of the time this ability is an active detriment that causes us to lose our action when we would much rather just be frightened. I'm begging you Larian, please change this, it is wild that we have been arguably weakened by a new class feature. Regardless, we continue our heroic journey and meet Balthazar. Call me crazy, but those villain senses are tingling away. He asks us to scout the rest of the gauntlet out for him and take care of any other resistance we might come across. We agree, for now, and ask him for a little bit of help in the process. He acquiesces, giving us a cute little bell to ring in case we need to summon Flesh, his brother. I can see the family resemblance. After our short discussion, we get back to it and start heading through a few trials that Shar had set up here to test our mad skills. Thelonious is never one to pass up an opportunity to show off his mad skills, so first up is the soft step trial. We throw on turn-based mode, use our speed to zoom up to this window, use Nier's boots to misty step through it, and dash up to this gate, which is easily lockpicked, allowing us to grab the umbral gem and get out of dodge, all without getting caught. The next trial is the self-same trial, which has us beating up some twisted villainous version of ourselves. To make things easier, we strip ourselves clean so our reflection won't have any of our gear. Then we sneak in, throw our gear back on, and pummel the poor sod before he's even realized what's just happened. There's only one Thelonious Monk Fisto, and he would never be so slow as to not make a move in a fight. Last is the Faith Leap Trial. Normally this trial involves navigating an invisible pathway using the map at the start of the room, but the pathway was very visible for us, probably because it saw what we did in the last trial and was too scared to hide. So we just walk across it and grab the gem, all in a day's work. On our hunt for the last gem we need, we end up following a cute kitty into a dark alley, where it leads us to an ambush by Yurgir, the devil Raphael had warned us about, and frankly, a straight criminal musician. For the crime of murdering that song, we decide to enact justice and put Yurgir and his goons out of their misery. As the fight starts, Yurgir immediately throws a bomb at us, which we deflect, and it doesn't explode, but it does knock us prone. So we start off by picking up all the other bombs scattered about, then we throw a couple of them at the Paragons above to hopefully chip away at them before using a key point to dash as a bonus action and start positioning ourselves better. The enemies all waste their turns dashing about in random directions, and Thelonious responds by firing at one with our bow a couple times before continuing to distance ourselves. Ourselves. Now that we're at a pretty safe distance and Yurgi refuses to move any closer, this fight is kind of a cakewalk. We just shoot at the enemies and run back a little bit. Some of the enemies do start jumping down, and we learn that their crossbow shots don't count as deflectable missiles, but they do pretty negligible damage. Next turn, we summon Flash using our action, and while he is a nice distraction, we mainly just want him to be taken out so we can have an easier time dealing with his big, or um, little brother later. Sure enough, the henchmen continue to jump down and wail on Flash while we get a few hits in and try to escape the amassing horde, resulting in a solid hit from the Displacer Beast, but we're still feeling fine. From here, we take out the enemies where we can, while well, they take out Flash, and have a little dance party on his grave, which seems a little rude, but hey, these are villains for a reason. Our hit and run strategy kinda just breaks most of the enemies, with them doing literally nothing on their turns, with the exception of the kitty who desperately runs back and forth trying to keep pace with us. Until eventually it too goes down. We take out another Maragon, causing its allies to get shocked into action, but it's too little too late with the rest following suit. Yurgir was also kind enough to jump down, but is still too hesitant to jump the gap in the stairs, so we just shoot him from afar and then turn the corner where he can't see us. And since he's got a tendency to go invisible, we use a neat little trick which Yol told me about to find where he's hiding by just pinging his portrait and shooting there. Rinse and repeat for a few million turns and he's down for the count. With the last remaining henchman joining his boss back in the hells a second later. We grab the last umbral gem and return to Balthazar to tell him the good news, and by that I mean pickpocket his speed potion and jump him while he isn't looking. It's a bit touch and go at times, but he does go down pretty quickly. Before we reveal our betrayal to the rest of Moonrise, we head into their dungeons to at least free the prison prisoners that they've captured. First, we gotta take out the two scrying eyes that patrol the area, so we wait for them to get together, slam on turn-based mode, and use Shatter from the funny amulet we got in Act 1 to blow them both up without anyone seeing. Then we start isolating the guards and taking them out one by one. They try and arrest us every time, which I find pretty comical given that we're actively trying to murder them, and when we go after the warden, she manages to alert a scrying eye that we missed, but it's nothing a couple bombs can't fix, before we get her too. With the guards taken out, it's as easy as equipping Wolverine's hammer, which deals extra damage to objects, and smashing down the walls of the prison, then hopping on the conveniently placed boat back to the last light in. Once back in safety, we learn that Wilburn is the worst, and I hate him, and I just want Barkus to be happy, and I'm gonna beat him up and uh, <clears throat> pardon, pardon me. 
We get a reward from Barkus in the form of a bomb called the Brilliant Retort, which is a surprise tool that will help us later. Now that the prisoners are free, we head back to the gauntlet and use our hard-won gems to pop open the final door and head towards the Night Song. We plunge into the watery portal and awaken in the Night Song's prison, a place that would make even Tai Lung blush if he had to break out of it. We reach the bottom and find the Night Song is both the source of Cathrick's immortality and in fact a demigod who is very ready to leave. I, I didn't edit that, that's just how she greeted us. Regardless, we lay a hand in gentle camaraderie on her and imbue her with a fraction of our power, freeing her from her prison and causing her to become Dame Aelin once more. She flies off to go whoop some old man Thorn booty and we race after her. At the front gates of Moonrise we find our surviving Harper allies. There's only like six of them, but they're led by our legendary fellow hero Jihira, so I don't see how we could lose. The fight begins and we move first, firing a couple shots onto their leader. Then it's all out war. Jihira runs in and she gets counterspelled, but that's okay, she clearly has a plan. Oh, oh, she's just getting shot. Is she trying to dodge? Uh, must be some sort of strategy. Oh, no, never mind. She just died. Uh, right. Well, we only ever needed one superhero so far. We start up our hit and run strategy, just firing with our bow and falling back. Our allies form a wall of flesh to slow down the enemies and start to pay for it pretty quickly. We back them up by throwing a few bombs, weakening the foe's front lines. The barrier made up of our backup continues getting eviscerated, and Quartermaster Tally decides she wants to die with her friends, while we continue to pelt away with some more bombs. And Tally gets her wish a moment later. Man, we really gotta start enforcing that no sidekick rule a little bit better. The last of our forces gets Cone of Colded on Zarel's next turn, and now it's just us. You know what that means, gang. Moving far enough away to force every enemy to dash, preferably into their own hunger of Hadar, every single turn. This results in these very dedicated henchmen getting afflicted by the Shadow Curse, since they want to kill us more than they want to stay alive. Only problem is when the curse kills them, we don't get any experience, and they also reanimate in a matter of seconds, thankfully, with really low AC and crappy attacks, but still a little annoying. We spend a few rounds whacking them and finishing up everyone that was foolish enough to follow us into the curse, and then finishing them off again. And when we get back to Moonrise, we find a few stragglers that never even joined the fight, and they just let us shoot them until they die. They don't even try and fight back. And you know what? I suppose after seeing one man just take out a whole army of my friends, I'd probably feel likewise. Thank god we were here to help the Harpers. Imagine how bad this would have been for them if Thelonious didn't save the day yet again. Continuing our onslaught upstairs, we bash in some skulls, face tank a fireball or two, beat up a lady, and head to the roof where Papa Thorm went for a smoke break all that time ago. At the top, we're greeted by the big man himself, who's more than a little peeved about his evil plans being ruined by a dude who showed up two days ago. Aelin arrives to put his villainous monologuing to an end and gives a rallying cry, and we just kinda square up. Our main concern in this fight is the necromancer goon Sustera, so we run up to her with a flurry of blows to knock her prone and get her with a stunning strike too. Catherick issues his goons to all go after our angelic assistant, so they mostly spend their turns doing just that while she starts duking it out with the big man. We get a killer couple crits on Sustera, taking her out before she can summon anyone else, and use an extra punch on the K-man, which means we still take an attack from his dog as we scramble away, critting us in turn. The dog just kinda takes itself out on its turn with Aelin's moonbeam, and Catherick gets swift revenge on Aelin, knocking her out for the first time. Thankfully, she bounces right back at the start of each of her turns. Thelonious heals up on our turn and moves right into a big group of bone boys to give them disadvantage on their attacks. This is where the fight really stabilizes. Since we've still got resistance to Necrotic from Isabel's Blessing, they can't do much to us even if they do hit. And they kinda just disintegrate to our fist due to their vulnerability to bludgeoning, and so long as we make a swing at Catherick each turn, he can't get us with any opportunity attacks. We make it our duty to purge all skeletons for the majority of the fight just to be extra safe. Once they're sufficiently depleted, we clobber the big thorn since he keeps going on about how he wants pictures of Thelonious for his newspaper. I don't know. I also really can't get over this fighting stance. Anyways, he summons a big old tentacle out of the ground and uses it to beat up our sidekick, and then also uses it to teleport both her and himself away somewhere deep underground. It's a very versatile tentacle. After hopping down the big hole left by the tentacle, we wind up in a hidden illithid colony and race after Catherick. Before that though, there's a fight we really want to do, and before we can take it on, we need to make sure the circuit we'll be kiting through is nice and open, so we start by assassinating a bunch of intellect devourers and putting this poor soul out of his misery. Before we move on, we slap on the old boost of speed for reasons you'll see soon. With that all done, we head to the next room, shoot a zombie to get its attention, blow up another one just for fun, and start pulling out of the room. The main 
gimmick in this one is the Death Shepherd at the back of the room, who can revive allies using a bonus action on each of its turns. If we can't tank him out, this fight's going nowhere. On our next turn, we use our boots to double our move speed and impose disadvantage on attacks of opportunity before beelining it straight to him. Except we get crit and realize that we're not actually imposing disadvantage at all for some reason. Whatever, we wholeness of body to heal up and use the extra bonus action to start beating the Shepherd to hell and back. The horrible horde encircles us on their turns while we step of the wind, disengage, and jump out of the way to line up a cone of cold with a scroll, severely wounding most of them and taking out a couple. Then we bunny hop back to the shepherd and beat him up a bit more, followed by more bunny hopping to the other side of the arena, because yes, this really is the fastest way to move. Thelonious gets encircled yet again, but we just hop out with another step of the wind and this time go for a very satisfying wall of fire. Oh, and punch the death shepherd for old time's sake before gallivanting away again. Unfortunately, one of the zombies zombies manages to get a nasty crit on us, and we're actually pretty low health from the two crits we've taken. So we use our superhuman strength to lob a bomb at the Death Shepherd, barely taking it out, before healing and taking out some more malicious malefactors. And now that the Death Shepherd isn't there to revive them, it's as easy as kiting and taking out our foes when we can. Before you know it, they're all gone. One reward for this fight is just enough experience to hit level 8. The only thing of note we get here is a new feat, and after a lot of deliberation, we decide to bump up our deck score by 2, which means with Ethel's hair, we're sitting at 20 without our graceful cloth. The reason why we did this is so we can swap our cloth early in Act 3 for a better one without losing out on our plus 5 dex mod. For now, we just wear the obsidian lace robe, which doesn't really do much for us, but it is stylish. Another reward is having to think real hard, which Thelonious ain't too great at, but once we solve the puzzle, we get a loose brain, pop it into a nearby machine so we can talk to it, and get the Gith Zerai Mind Barrier, which gives us advantage on all intelligence saving throws for the rest of our playthrough. A pretty nice get if I say so myself. There's one last supervillain to take out in this act, and now it's time to face him. We descend to the depths where we find Ketherick chatting away with Gortash and Orin, his accomplices who will no doubt need to take out in the future. And we see the face of the Absolute at last. It's a brain. A big ol' scary brain. Once it's gone and takes Gorin with it, we get to work. We start by summoning our favorite little guy and down a potion of flying for ourselves, followed by throwing a potion of invisibility to get the both of us. Worth mentioning, we've also got an elixir of heroism active to help with attacks and saving throws. It takes a few turns off our potion counter, but we get into position and use Scratch to free Dame Aelin from her imprisonment. Who's a good immortality ending boy? You are, yes you are. And we reveal ourselves with a flurry of blows on the nearby Mind Flayer before getting it with a stunning strike. Aelin starts up her beef again with some wailing on the intellect of ours well, we make sure Scratch gets dismissed safely, since only a monster would let him die. Thelonious manages to take out the Mind Flayer on our next turn with a stunning strike and a couple other heavy blows. With the biggest threat out of the way, we fly around using our insane move speed to obliterate the nefarious Necromites wherever they are, and our sidekick takes out the foes on the ground. Once they're all dealt with, we have to refresh our potion of flying, but we were stockpiling them the whole act, so we've still got loads to go. And we just swoop down and beat up Ketherick every turn without him able to retaliate at all, especially since Bash is still bugged and does literally nothing. He just kind of works out his rage on our immortal pal. A few more rounds like this, and that's the last supervillain of the act. Oh man, that was pretty easy. Wait, wait, what are you, what are you doing? No, no, wait. Uh, uh oh, who's talking? Oh, just a god of death. Ha, here I thought we should be scared. We've been outrunning this guy for ages. Death? Just try and keep up. Wait, dang, not like that. That's right, before we even got a turn, we're frightened, which automatically uses our action to get rid of it, which means our plan has already gone to hell. So we down a potion of invis, trying to buy ourselves one turn without getting frightened, forgetting that Call of the Damned is a map-wide AoE that's gonna break it. Thankfully, we make the save on the fear anyways, and it's go time. We fly up to the high ground and use one of the many arrows of darkness we've also been stockpiling to blind the Apostle, making it so the only attack it can do is the Call of the Damned. Then, we top off our turn by topping up our health, just to be safe. Next round, we start our new routine of flying down, punching the God of Death a whole bunch with our bare fist, and then flying back up to relative safety. His hand Benjamin failed to do much to us thanks to our shield amulet, and since he can't do much either, we just fire another darkness arrow to make sure the cloud doesn't expire, well, keeping our health up and his health down. And despite just refreshing the darkness, it instantly vanishes and he shoots us with a beam which of course frightens us. Desperate times call for desperate measures. We use a potion of speed to get an action, and this time fire a darkness arrow at his feet so we can fire off another one on his other side if we need to. Surely both clouds won't wear out at the same time. We're off to the other side of the arena after that to avoid the necromites and heal in peace. Another round of being alive and we use wholeness of body for that sweet sweet extra flurry of blows each turn. From here we're looking pretty good. We fire off another darkness arrow on his other side to be safe, and with our flight we can easily get a bunch of hits each turn without having to worry. We refresh our 
speed potions as well when we need to, and the poor weak little deity can't even eat his own goons to save his life since he's blind. Merkel gets brought down to 20 HP, and we're on our last turn of speed potion. A regular hit might not be enough, so we fly out of the way and we use something with a little bit more boom. Now that's a supervillain down. Hey, that's my kill. And my line for that matter. We grab his cool little rock as a reward, Thelonious gets the respect he deserves from our dream visitor, the Celesbians, that's Celestial Lesbians, have a touching reunion, we get into a conversation that is way above Thelonious' mental capacities, and we head at last to the road to Baldur's Gate, where a whole city in need of saving awaits. Our hero finds himself just outside the city proper, taking it easy for the evening when all of a sudden some ghastly gith goons show up out of a portal to jump us. Initiative starts and we hop too, quite literally. We leap past all these chumps and head straight to the astral portal where our dream visitor is calling for aid. We arrive in time to see our dream visitor about to catch some hands, so we jump into action. Thelonious downs an elixir of heroism, not that he needs to be even more heroic, and joins a fight between a couple of gith and a horde of friendly intellect devourers. Our turn comes quick, and we manage to get a good old thwack on one before stunning striking them as well. The intellect devourers follow us up by absolutely shredding the unstunned one, though they in turn get a little beat up too. The next round goes strikingly similar, with us unable to finish off the gith we're bullying but still stunning them, and our cranial companions get their ranks thinned down even more. Thankfully on our next go we take out the first of this dastardly duo, and our last remaining brain boy avenges his pals a couple turns later. Now that's sidekick material. Regardless, we trudge onwards to the giant god skull and take a quick break with a potion of angelic reprieve to get our juice back. And then we enter the fight. Turns out our dream visitor is actually a mind flayer called the Emperor, and even stranger, our villain senses are tingling around him like wild. Either way, we side with him for now, rushing into combat to focus on the more immediate bad guys, and god dang, these guys got hands. Let's uh, let's just move on to attempt two. Before we head back into the fight, we precast Blur using a scroll to help keep ourselves alive. Turn one, we get a successful stunning strike on this bozo, followed by a very nice flurry of blows before retreating backwards as usual. The baddies entirely ignore us, choosing instead to blow up the Emperor's henchmen. Our tentacled pal doesn't take this lying down though and gets a killer double stun on a couple of them. Unfortunately, we completely fail to finish off the foe we were beating up even after knocking them prone and making our chance to hit 94%. And the enemies start to take notice of us too, which is real bad, especially since this knocks us prone and we lose our blur. Now we've really got to think about just surviving, so we go for a stunning strike on the closest goon and try and make some distance. We learn the hard way, however, that it straight up does not matter how far we move. Thankfully, they follow up that incredible leap with some unincredible whiffs. Then Thelonious gets another stunning strike off on the leaping leader and finally finishes off the low HP goon. And we top up our health for good measure. Good thing we did too, cause these henchmen are really laying it on heavy now. On our next turn, we use wholeness of body to heal up and get an extra bonus action, and we show off our mad skills by missing not one nor two, but four whole attacks in a row and then sauntering over to the edge. Another round goes by with pretty much everybody missing each other, but soon after we get a good couple flurry of blows on one of the fellas and take him out. The Emperor seizes the momentum and dominates one of the other surviving fellas, but he's getting worryingly low on health. Especially so since the fella has stillness of mind and breaks out of it, before the Emperor triggers an opportunity attack crit, which is not ideal. And we can't land an attack if our life depended on it, which it does, but neither can the enemies apparently, it's just whiff city out here. But that doesn't stop our mindless mind flare from triggering even more critical hit opportunity attacks. It's do or die time, and boy does Thelonious know how to save his heroics for the last moment. With an insane double crit flurry of blows, we take out the last goon, and now it's just the head honcho left. Since we're out of key points, we just focus on healing up ourselves and the Emperor by chucking some healing potions at both of our feet. We spend our next couple turns beating them down slowly but surely, and almost go down when they get a strong crit and a regular old hit, but thankfully the Emperor finishes them off with a chain lightning. Wait, hold up, a chain lightning? You mean one of the strongest AoE spells in the game? Why, why would you save that for when there's one guy left? Uh, whatever. After the fight, we have a quick chat with the Emperor and learn that he's staving off the influence of the Absolute by using Orpheus's power and keeping him imprisoned. Now, naturally, holding a man prisoner isn't very heroic, so we put it in our list of things to work out and get our first item upgrade from one of the gith. The boots of uninhibited Kashiko are replacing our evasive shoes, and they have the simple effect of granting us bonus damage equal to our wisdom modifier on our unarmed strikes. 
Not a complicated effect, but the extra boost to damage is nice enough to lose out on a bit of AC if you ask me, especially since our hidden run strats keep us out of attack range most of the time anyways. The next morning, we head down into the outskirts of the city and find a young whippersnapper who's lost their mom. We give her some of our cheapest grub, then we hop on our merry way with another innocent help. Where we encounter one of our greatest roadblocks, a stubborn guard and a drawbridge. But Thelonious uses his super speed to pull a flash and just vibrate straight through the solid wood with the help of a potion of flying. And just like that, we've made it inside at Worms Rock, where good old Gortash is getting coronated as Archduke. Our villain senses are going absolutely haywire. I mean, just look at this guy. Who knows how many crimes he's committed? Although, at least we know they weren't fashion crimes. He offers to work together with us if we take out Orin and then rule the world with him afterwards. We play along for now, but make no mistake, we'll be coming back for him. At last, we arrive in the titular Baldur's Gate, where we have another encounter with this nerd from Act 1 who tried to hunt down the Night Song on behalf of Leroican, the ruler of this big old wizard tower we find ourselves outside of. Thelonious manages to shoo him away, and thankfully that's the last we'll see of him. Regardless, we've got to have some words with Leroican, so we head up top and get the 411 on him. It takes us all of 5 seconds to decide we're gonna rob him for all he's worth, and then come back with Aelin and do another superhero team up on this guy's spine. Starting, of course, with robbing him for all he's worth, cause that's what heroes do. And of course we read the odd powerful arcane book too to make sure we get every power up we can. Unfortunately, one of these treacherous tomes actually curses us a wee bit, but once we get outside we use a scroll of remove curse on ourselves and end up with the Tharkiate Codex Blessing which grants us a free 20 temp HP at the end of each long rest, permanently. Now that we've got a bit more money in our pockets, we head to the Circus of the Last Days and talk to this little Mephit fellow to procure a statue of ourselves. I mean, it costs 5k gold, but every good hero has a statue of them. Apart from it looking absolutely gallant, it also gives the Sweet Stone features permanent buff, which is essentially a permanent bless, granting another 1d4 to all of our attack rolls and saving throws. And our shopping spree ain't done yet. We head to Leroikin's tower and use the goods we stole from him to haggle our way into getting the Vest of Soul Rejuvenation. This bad boy is some clothing that increases our AC by 2, lets us regain 1d4 HP whenever we succeed to save against a spell, and to top it off whenever an enemy misses us, we can make an unarmed attack against them as a reaction. This is why we bumped our decks up to 20 prematurely at level 8. With this, we're increasing both our survivability and damage output by a pretty large margin, and our AC is now a base of 24. And we're still not done. Now we're off to Anthari Danthalon at Danthalon's Dancing Axe, and this magnificent merchant supplies us with the Horns of the Berserker, the final piece of our super suit. For now. This helmet will be replacing our haste helm, which means we'll be a little slower at the start of fights, but in exchange we get plus 2 on attack rolls to damaged foes. As well as an extra 2 necrotic damage on our melee attack so long as we don't have full health. But if we don't deal damage on a turn, we take 1d4 damage ourselves. Either way, with this, our super suit is pretty well finished, with the exception of one more upgrade we'll get much later. And of course, a good super suit is color coordinated. And a special shout out to the vest which has 4 extra capes built into it. Now we're really ready to save some lives. But before we get around to saving the whole world, we gotta have a training montage first. To start, Thelonious puts the ghost inside of the hee hee ha ha funny amulet we got from Act 1 to rest and gains the ability to cast Tasha's hideous laughter at will. Then we gallivant about the sewers, beating up the Oz serial killer and blowing up half of the sewer system itself, which is probably an okay thing to do if you consider all the jobs it creates for the community. After all this, we get enough experience for a level 9, granting us an increased proficiency bonus up to plus 4 and advanced unarmored movement, making it so difficult terrain no longer affects us and we can jump an extra 6 meters so long as we're unarmored. On top of that, we get key resonation punches, which are basically normal unarmed attacks that give enemies the resonating condition, allowing us to spend a key point detonating them and any other nearby resonating enemies for 3d6 force damage. Now, this does give us a way to use unarmed attacks while still wielding weapons for the extra effects, but only if the enemy isn't resonating, which I found to be kind of a pain, so we ultimately just went forward without any melee weapons. Especially since our martial arts damage die also goes up to a d8 at this level. The training montage continues with us beating up the rudest dude. Oh, and also breaking up a gang fight at the same time. That's that's totally why we fought these guys. Then we go off and sneak into a bank. I swear it was just to stop a bank robbery, since for some reason they didn't seem to believe that we could handle it. But we did. Just uh, don't look too close at all the blood around the place. And while we're taking a rest, we find out that the motherless kid from earlier was kidnapped by Orin and the only way to free her is to kill Gortash. Not that we need more motivation for that. But before we get around to dealing with that problem, we noticed a big old palace in the city that caused our villain senses to go off. So we head over to check it out and get stopped by the very obviously brainwashed guards on the way in. So we hear their brainwashing the old-fashioned way and continue inside. Once inside, we find Casador's sinister Casador, which very clearly needs something special to unlock it, but hey, at least we know we're on the right track. 
I mean, if even the doors are sinister. To unlock it, it's just a matter of sneaking into a dead girl's room, tiptoeing around her necrotic corpse, stealing her dictionary of a dead language, then beating up the resident old man who is not but bones and yoinking his family ring. Back to the sinister door to open that bad boy up and, uh, oh no, I, uh, I feel I've interrupted something. Uh, sorry fellas, I'll just be, oh, oh god, they're attacking. Well, there is a lot of them and it does initially look pretty scary, especially since the rats can open doors, our key resonation allows us to do some, uh, pretty funny stuff that makes most of the fight a breeze. Once they get detonated, it's just a matter of a few more rounds and a couple more punches. And a moment after that fight ends, we get level 10. With this level up, we get yet another 1.5 meters of unarmored movement, making us even speedier and, believe me, we'll need it. Plus, we also get purity of body, which makes our impeccable bod even better with immunity to poison damage and the poisoned condition. This feature comes a little late in the game to be genuinely useful, since there's only a couple fights in Act 3 where it has any use at all, but better late than never, I suppose. Continuing our journey, we find some prisoners being held in the depths of the house who've been turned into vampire spawn and are begging for their freedom. Thelonious doesn't leave any poor souls imprisoned though, so we go to confront the lord of the house Kazador Sar and put this issue to rest. The fight starts and he hits us with a supercharged blight, thanks to him being in the middle of a ritual that empowers him, before running on up to us in mist form and uh, yeah, yeah, that's the, that's the whole fight. Hoo boy. So, that wasn't great, and that was with an elixir of necrotic resistance too. Round 2, we summon Scratch and our best boy gets the drop on him to uh, distract him, so we can at least get one turn in. But it kinda just breaks the whole fight, even once we join, Kazador's ritual never actually starts, and without his ritual sources, he's kinda just a regular spellcaster, not a supervillain. So we reload an older save to make sure we have a worthy opponent. The next go around we try starting the fight by casting a global invulnerability scroll which breaks the fight in the same way so I guess we kinda have to let Kazdor maybe one shot us if we want any sort of challenge. Since the biggest challenge we're having is Senor Sar one-shotting us before we get a go, we try using an elixir of vigilance for an extra plus 5 to initiative. We approach him the old-fashioned way, the ritual starts, and we go first. We start by stepping on one of the ritual sources granting us the benefits instead, which is 10 temp HP and 1d10 extra necrotic damage per source. Then we cast Globe of Invulnerability to make sure we keep alive, before downing a necrotic resistance elixir for some extra future proofing. Next round we zoom across the arena to the weakest link of the ritual, a level 1 zombie Asterian with 10 HP, and when not opportunity attack is made against us, we learn a neat trick. Thanks to our robes, when the attack misses us, we get to make an attack in response, and that triggers our extra attack feature, essentially granting us one free bonus attack this turn. Thelonious takes out Zomsterian and dashes over to the next furthest ritual source, further weakening Sar. The rancid rabble rousers we're up against always their turns dashing on over to us, and at the start of our turn we take a buttload of damage thanks to Kazador's stank aura. Step of the Wind disengages the real hero of this fight, with its ability to give us infinite jumps and get us out of binds. We use it to get out of the way before casting Sunbeam with a spell scroll, which not only helps clear out all the goons, but it also creates an invisible sunlight aura around us if Kazador is fool enough to get close to us. Then we use our Mad Hobbs to get far far away to a source at the opposite side of the room. A bit of a problem arises when the vampiric villain resurrects Asterion on his turn and reconnects him to the ritual. To get around this we do a bit of a repeat of last turn, but instead of sunbeaming we throw a bomb on the crowd after getting out. Then we use the extra bonus action Asterion's source grants us to heal and take him out again. It just keeps happening though, but thankfully Papa Sar is using Call Lightning now which is a deck save and thanks to evasion and our robes that basically means we are healing off of it. To deal with this Asterion problem once and for all, we step of the wind disengage over to him, use the extra bonus action to kill him, stuff his corpse in a bag, and use our super speed to run him straight to camp where Sar can't reach him. Problem solved. Now on future turns we can finally go back to our disengage plus sunbeam dance to thin out the horde and always making sure to end our turn on a ritual source. That is, until old Shatterteeth makes us fearful and makes himself priority number one. So we mix in a wholeness of body one turn to get both health and key back and use the extra bonus action granted by it to bully the old fellow. Kazador starts to resort to physical violence when he realizes his spells just aren't cutting it. Sunbeam continues to decimate his forces and Chatterteeth goes down all in one round. Next turn we blow up some folks with our key resonation and finish off most of the rest of the goons with Sunbeam. One more turn and one more resonating boom and it's just us and the big seaman himself. He continues to pointlessly call lightning on us while we zoom around taking out all the sources one by one while he screams bloody murder. Once all of his little power ups have been taken away, the head honcho falls soon after. Even in the face of first turn one shots, the Lonius prevails. And we got a new record for our longest fight with a whopping 46 rounds. 
Then it's a matter of putting the big man to rest for good and using his staff to free all the innocents nearby. All in a day's work. With one supervillain out of the way, it's time for our team up with Aelin against Laroakin. We tell her that he's trying to capture her in the same way Kethrick did and she's immediately off to his tower. We arrive after her just in time to hear the roast of a century. And then we throw down. This fight really isn't too hard. The only thing we need to worry about is Laroakin's elemental retort which deals a bajillion damage if we hit him while his elemental Myrmidons are still kicking. So we just go after his conjured cronies incapable of counterattacking in any meaningful way Well, Dame Aelin gets shown up by a literal puppet on strings. Truly impressive. Laroakin is nice enough to heal us up every now and then too by spamming fireballs, which is awfully sweet. And we make short work of all the elementals before too long, without them dealing any major damage to us. Once they're out of the way, we check to see if this wily wizard knows Featherfall. Spoiler alert, he doesn't. In typical Aelin fashion, she decides to start monologuing and uh, oh, oh my god, what is she doing? Oh my god, um... Uh, well, that's Laroakin done. Now it's time to start going after the big bads, starting with Gortash's police force, since the only force of justice this city needs is Thelonious himself. Along the way, we encounter our old friend Volo being lynched, so we intervene before things get too out of hand. This fight is pretty straightforward, but the numbers are against us as usual, and if we're not careful, we can get caught out of position and get got. But as long as we're cautious, we can just shoot Volo's chair to free him and slowly pick down the enemies one by one until the fight is dealt with. After all we've done for old Volothamp, he finally decides to join us in our camp as our man in the chair. About darn time. Continuing on, we arrive outside the steel foundry, where we go invisible to sneak inside. Once inside, we meet up with Gandhi and Xanar Tubin, who lets us know they're being forced to build the Steel Watchers, both with explosive collars and families that are being held hostage. He agrees to help us revolt if we free their people first, and unfortunately we can't ask him to stay out of the way, so we're off to the Iron Throne. We beat up some bad bad dogs along the way and commandeer a cool submarine by intimidating his driver. While we're en route to the underwater prison, Gortash rings us up seeming genuinely hurt by our betrayal, which, I mean, like, we're a superhero, man, what did you expect? Anyways, he threatens to blow up the Iron Throne with everyone inside if we don't turn back, but he clearly overestimates how long this is gonna take us. With our sidekick Scratch at our side, we down a potion of speed and get to work. Thelonious goes full super speed, using a step of the wind dash to increase our speed and give infinite jumps, and we hop around to free every single prisoner in the place in one single turn. We also use both of our actions to dash, putting our base speed up to 126 meters. Meters. Given that our jump distance is about 11 meters and it costs 3 meters of movement to jump, that means we can move approximately 462 meters in a single round if we jump our max distance every time. And since a round is 6 seconds long, that means we're moving 77 meters a second, which translates to 172 miles per hour or 277 kilometers per hour. Okay, admittedly we don't save everyone on turn 1 because this person requires a help action to rescue, but we get everybody else. Everyone starts doing their best impression of Thelonious and zooming towards the exit. Well, the Flummox fish folk fell are left in the dust. Next round, we free the person strapped in the chair, and oh, oh my god, oh good lord, that's a piece of their head. Oh, I can see why they were imprisoned. We should have left them here. We should have never freed them. What have we done? I we hop around and stun some more enemies while leaving ourselves in the wide open to distract and refresh our speed pot. Scratch ain't just sitting around either, as he manages to lock one of the Sahuagin inside a cell. Good boy. The aberration prisoner begins to, uh, move, uh, approach, closer. Oh, oh god, she's coming. Oh, please, run, escape. On future turns, we take one from our sidekick's book and start closing the gates on the guards to trap them in. And before you know it, everyone manages to escape and make it intact to the submarine. Everyone. I honestly can't believe how well that went, nor how fast the Lonius could really go. Talk about super speed. We head back to tell the factory workers the good news and start the revolution. And they die. Uh, yeah, they die real fast, but at least we saved the people in the prison. The folks downstairs also get a wee bit blown up, but that's not our fault. We do at least complete the quest, though. Thelonius becomes an Avenger again and takes out the rest of the factory guards on this floor with the old hit and run, as well as an unfortunate steel watcher that got pulled into the fight. Once the fight's over, we make sure the Gondian's deaths weren't in vain with the help of a Speak with Death scroll, and we're off to the basement to deliver the death blow. As soon as we arrive in the basement, two Hellfire watchers immediately come barreling towards us. But on our turn, we down a potion of flying, start beating up on the generic goons, and then just fly up to the rafters far out of reach. The enemies really struggle to do anything meaningful so long as we keep this up. The Watchers can jump up here, though they don't do so often, and when they do it just gives us the opportunity to do a buttload of falling damage to them. With the help of a few key explosions, a good few dozen bloodless elixir fueled punches, our flying potion, and of course more explosions, the fight finishes up without the enemies able to do a darn thing in return. During the fight, we also hit level 11, which grants us tranquility, making long rest give us sanctuary afterwards. This feature is almost entirely useless to us, and it's all we get at this level, so there's not much more to say about it. 
The extra HP and key point is always nice though. Continuing to the final room, we enter a fight with the factory's magnum opus, the Steel Watcher Titan, and three more Hellfire Watchers too. Thankfully, the Watchers are all ranged, meaning our deflect missiles makes us feel a whole lot safer. So we start up the old hit and run strat, beating one of them up pretty good before moving into the corner of the room to rinse and repeat on future rounds. The Watchers predictably miss, firing only one shot each, while the Titan fails to curse us and instead makes sure our health is topped up. One of them starts to blow up and we get a little spooky and make the mistake of ending our turn next to a different one which blasts us with Hellfire, which can neither be resisted nor mitigated in any way. So we heal up with wholeness of body and start getting our revenge with a couple flurries of blows. On their turns, we get some good use out of our deflect missiles before the one we bullied decides to end it all so we can't get our hands on it. Worth mentioning, the Steel Watch Titan is kinda just watching all of this go down and has resorted to hurling threats at us while its pals blow up around it. We pull yet another silly billy move and end our turn too close to a watcher which means we get a free hellfire shower, but we also get an attack of opportunity which sends it into explosion mode. Now that just the Titan is left and it can't seem to go up these stairs, we have absolutely zero problem bullying it over the course of quite a few rounds until it too decides to free itself of the incredible nuisance that must be fighting Thelonious. Our reward for beating this steel machine of death is Gaunter Mail, a plus 3 longbow that we have proficiency with thanks to our race. It also sheds light in a 6 meter radius, has a chance to inflict the Guiding Bolt condition on enemies, essentially granting our next attack on them advantage, and has a special shot once per short rest, which has a chance to frighten and make all future shots do 1d4 extra radiant damage for a few turns. But most importantly, it lets us cast Celestial Haste once per long rest as an action, which is the exact same thing as haste, but it only lasts 5 turns and doesn't make you lethargic after it ends, so there's no real risk to casting it. Because of that, we'll be sticking with this bad boy for the rest of the run. Before we can take our spoils and go, we input the code to blow the place to kingdom come, and use our impeccable super speed to get out of dodge. This footage actually had to be slowed down so the human eye could even comprehend what it was seeing. With the steel foundry down for the count, it's time to raid Worms Rock Fortress. We bulldoze our way past any of Gortash's forces that get in the way, with them standing no real chance, especially with a bloodlust elixir on our side. Once we make it to the top, we cast Celestial Haste on ourselves and jump into the fight with Gordy and his pal. On our first turn, we get an immediate stunning strike on the talentless tyrant, followed up by blowing up the trap that gives him resistances and pummeling him a bit more. The baddies don't do much but surround us, which just means we gotta whack at them to trigger our mobile feet, and keep Gortash stunlocked with another strike, and a good flurry afterwards on him just for old time's sake. The real kicker comes when one of the goons manages to get a command halt on us despite all of our bonuses to our wisdom saves, which gives Gortash enough time to go Super Saiyan and summon his big ol' hand. To make matters worse, the enemies also manage to land a good couple stabs on us. Thelonious uses wholeness of body for a power up of her own, as well as a step of the wind disengage to get out of this bind. Thankfully, Gortash also summoned a bunch of low health ghosts, which buff him and his allies, but also make for great bloodlust cannon fodder. With our extra action, we whiff a stunning strike on Gort, but a trap shoots out a grenade, so we blow it up to help weaken all the goons. Someone was awfully inspired by that move and gives it a go themselves, but our evasion makes it so we don't take any damage from the explosion. After taking out another ghost, we stun Gortash and bully the ever-loving crap out of him, cause the boy has just way too much temp HP from his transformation. Another round goes by, and between our mad saves and deflect missiles, we manage to avoid anything bad happening to us. And when it makes it back to Thelonious, we take out two more goons, leaving just one left, with a combination of punches and key explosions. With action points to spare for a stunning strike on Gortash, who must have a hell of a concussion by now, as well as some more throat punches while he's still reeling. We take out the last goon a turn later and keep the short-lived Sovereign stunlocked until he joins the rest of his momentary Mayfly Kingdom in the Great Beyond. While we loot him, we grab his Reflecto Guards, which are surprise tools that will help us later, so keep an eye on them. We also grab his cool little rock, which we'll need to take on the giant purple alien threatening to destroy the world, and hey, wait a minute, I've seen this superhero story before. Now that we've dealt with Gortash, we head back to camp and find a note from Orin giving us the passcode to her cutthroat cultist clubhouse called the Murder Tribunal. Thelonious zips on over there, and we find ourselves face to face with Saravok Anchev, a ballist who almost brought Baldur's Gate to ruin a century ago. With a villain like this in front of us, Thelonious has no choice but to throw hands. The fight kicks off and Saravok comes immediately charging at us. Thankfully he misses and we start wailing on him in turn, but he's a tough cookie with three tough henchmen who all buff him up. Worst of these buffs is haste, which lets him actually stand a chance at keeping pace with us. 
Even on the turns he dashes, he can still reach us and deliver some deadly heavy blows thanks to his extra action. As with any fight, we start by thinning the horde, even though these guys grant powerful permanent boons to their ballast boss when they die. Either way, with a wholeness of body, step of the wind disengage, and flurry of blows, we start chipping away at one of them. We also head pretty far to the other side of the arena. Not far enough, however, as Papa Anchev still reaches us with only one dash used. Thelonious might be facing an impossible foe, someone who can actually keep up with him. Thelonious lands a rebuttal blow, but our chance to hit is too low for my taste, even with an elixir of heroism active. We then go after the goon who had casted haste on the boss man, and despite breaking their concentration, he's actually immune to the lethargic condition, so not much happens. We just bite the bullet and finish them off, granting Saravok a permanent haste. To make sure we don't have problems running away, we throw down a speed pot on ourselves, but make the mistake of doing it on some stairs. Pro tip, don't throw potions on stairs, especially when you're out of movement. Miraculously, the big guy just runs up to us and ends his turn. I honestly have no idea how this happened, but I'm not going to look a gift Saravok in the mouth. We get our speed potion benefit, destroy one of the other henchfolk giving a permanent plus 6 AC to the reverse Thelonious, and we throw a potion of flying down so we can zip up to the high ground and heal up with a potion there. With us in the corner of the room, Anchev is actually forced to pull a Mario Kart and double dash, which means even though he reaches us, he can't swing at us. On our turn, we take out the last remaining blood-drenched bozo and give the big guy one final boon, letting him heal 2d12 each time he damages anything. And we zip on over to as far as we can go while still in the room. It works out and another double dash is forced. Seems like at least with a potion of speed and flying, we are the superior speedster. Only problem is he's got sanctuary on him from one of his goons before they passed, so we conjure up an angel with a spell scroll to force him to attack something other than ourselves. And once on the opposite side of the room, we cast the actual spell haste with another scroll since our Ocean was about to run out. The plan works perfectly. He goes after the angel, breaking the sanctuary, and leaving himself vulnerable on our next turn, where we use an arrow of Ilmater to prevent healing from his attacks, and absolutely lay into him as much as we can. He stays distracted for one more round, dealing heavy damage to our conjured companion, but letting us repeat the same cycle as last turn, taking him noticeably below half health. After that, he seems to catch on though, and heads straight across the room for us, managing to land a blow since he only had to dash once. We try and use the same plan, but our last arrow of Ilmater misses, so we settle for zipping away trying to get that forced double dash and healing up. Our angel also gets dismissed to make sure he can't heal off of them. Once again, the double dash doesn't get forced though, and we're starting to get worried, especially since if he breaks our concentration, we're completely done for. So we get our standard blows in, chipping away at his health, and decide to distance ourselves a little bit further this time, just to be sure. But as we fly across the room, the unthinkable happens. The few extra meters of safety net we give ourselves causes initiative to break, and before we can do anything, Saravok fully heals. I was heartbroken. I did not know how to deal with this. I didn't want to take a rest and refresh our resources since I prefer to do fights all in one go, but it was also a very long fight, and I didn't want to just give up either. So, not knowing what to do, after our haste and potion of flying ran out, we just walk back up to him and he treats us like we were caught trespassing, and the fight resumes with us down on resources and morale. We go for Tasha's hideous laughter, and to the shock of no one, it doesn't work before using Step of the Wind Dash to move pretty far away, though not as far, obviously. We measure out roughly 38 meters, and thankfully that was enough to force the double dash without breaking initiative. On our next turn, we start up a cycle of punching him and downing potions of speed whenever we need, before moving away as far as we could. Thelonious isn't always able to move far enough away, but Saravok seems to be taking pity on us, and he misses a surprising amount of attacks. We try mixing in the odd spell scroll here and there to slow him down, but the guy is practically unstoppable. Only once we down a potion of flying and use it to move out a measured 38 meters, give or take, are we able to reliably force the double dash. To force him to move a bit more awkwardly, we also take out this ladder, which definitely helps an insane amount. It practically wins the fight on its own. Eventually, though, we run out of speed pods, so we throw down a haste spore grenade we got in Act 1 to essentially give us one more turn of haste and safely remove it without becoming lethargic. Thankfully, from here we learn with the ladder gone, we are more than fast enough to force the double dash with just a potion of flying. Thank god for that ladder being breakable. And over the course of what felt like eons, we whittle away at his health until at last, with a bomb and a terrible camera angle, we blow up a proper supervillain and prove ourselves the fastest in the land. I guess you could say he really gave us a run for our money. We yoink the loot from his corpse along with the amulet we need to get into Oren's actual hideout, free the nearby imprisoned detective who properly praises our heroism, and go at last to rescue that girl Oren kidnapped. Thelonious arrives just in the nick of time, in typical heroic fashion, and tells Oren to unhand the girl before… well, yeah, before that happens. Whoops. Absolutely enraged, we start the fight against Orin and get ready to obliterate her. We go in with Celestial Haste and an Elixir of Heroism active. 
And we've got a plan. On our first turn, we don't do much past use wholeness of body for an extra bonus action and head up the stairs. This makes Orin in Slayer form dash and jump on up to us. So on our next turn, we use the Artistry of War scroll we got from Laroakin to deal 6 guaranteed hits to Orin, reducing her unstoppable stacks. We followed up with a Magic Missile scroll for 3 more as well. With our first bonus action, we use Flurry of Blows, reducing her down to 1 last stack, and with our final bonus action, we get rid of said stack and push her off all in one fell swoop. After that, it's not hard to dismantle the rest of these child murderers one by one. We weren't able to save poor Yenna, but we were able to make sure the Boorish Ballas won't be claiming any more victims. The final stone we need to destroy the Netherbrain is acquired at the same time, but before we do that, we've got to take care of some other villainous hives. While we're wandering through the city, we come across the Devil's Fee. The owner implies she can open up a portal to hell, and it's high time we take care of her old fiendish nemesis who keeps popping up. So we get the jump on the portal proprietor and take her out lickety split. She does conjure up a gazillion golden goons though, but they go down too easy enough. In addition to getting everything we need to make the portal, we also get enough experience for level 12. And with it, our final feet. One last ability score improvement, bumping our wisdom up to 18 and his modifier up to plus 4, increasing our damage, armor class, and saving throws all at once. Feeling wiser than ever before, we pop open the portal and make our way into the House of Hope. Upon entering, we meet the source of old genuine heroism, Hope herself, who's being imprisoned and battered by Raphael. She asks us to grab the Orphic Hammer and free her. Thelonious, already enraged by recent events, goes on a rampage through the house, slaughtering all of the demonic denizens along the way and also grabbing quite a bit of loot. Notably, we grab the Helldust Helmet, which is a surprise tool that will help us later, a key to Raphael's hidden safe wherein we find a magic passcode, and the Amulet of Greater Health. This amulet sets our constitution to 23, massively increasing our max HP, and it also gives advantage on con saving throws, basically meaning we'll never lose concentration, aside from also boosting our survivability to an insane degree. In between fights, we've been using Raphael's Bath to give us all the benefits of a long rest at just the click of a button, and we make sure to do so again here. Before heading over to the archives and using the magic passcode we got earlier to release the Orphic Hammer. Now I've just got a free hope and get out of here, so we head to the basement where she's being imprisoned and get into a tussle with her guards. With the help of this little doorway, we can just poke our head out and shoot before running back into cover. We do this for a little while and all these multi-eyed monsters don't stand a chance. And with a whack here and a bit of a whack there, we free Hope, who definitely has the right spirit of things. Here's hoping we can get out before Raphael catches on. Oh no, we did not get out before Raphael caught on. We've made it this far though, and we're not gonna slow down now. Come on, villain, let's throw hands. Oh good god, wait, hold up a second, that, that was too fast, man, you gotta give me a moment, I, uh, okay, uh, so attempt one didn't go great. We prep attempt two by going in with a bloodlust elixir and protection from evil and good on ourselves, so the enemies have disadvantage on hitting us. And we've also got Wolbrin's hammer equipped, which we grabbed in act two since it deals bonus force damage to objects, which the pillars are vulnerable to. To make sure Hope doesn't die, we also throw down a potion of invisibility on her so she never actually enters combat, and we use wholeness of body before charging into the fight. This time around, only Yurgir goes before us and he completely whiffs. Thelonious starts with a potion of speed since we'll definitely be needing it before using a flurry of blows on one of the pillars, massively damaging it and with a couple more swings with our hammer, the first one is down already. With each pillar that falls, Raphael gets weakened since each one grants 1d12 extra hellfire damage as well as a plus 3 to dexterity. Not to mention he can use them to heal, as well as fuel his powerful spells such as the one he one shot us with last time. To keep ourselves alive, we use a reflecto guard to make all projectiles bounce off of us for a round and we get one less flurry of blows on the next pillar over. The reflection works perfectly on both the infernal lackeys and their master, actually dealing quite a lot of damage to the latter. On our next turn, we finish off the second pillar with a flurry of blows and use our reaction attack from our robes to trigger our extra attack which we use to throw down a potion of flying, which lets us zoom across the room and with another flurry and a good hammer whack, we take out a third pillar too. We try and refresh our reflecto guard so we have it for this round too, but our reflecto guard reflects it and just does nothing instead. So we settle for a couple good thwacks on the last pillar and call our turn there. Raphael has his turn skipped as he detransforms from his ascended mode and all the other enemies whiff too. This gives us plenty of time to take out the last pillar with another flurry before zooming down to take out Carilla and trigger our elixir, and we wail on Raphael with some very hopeful stunning strikes which don't really pan out. But we fly out of the room and use our last haste spore grenade to pull the same trick we did against Saravok, ending the hasted condition without becoming lethargic. From here, it's classic hit and run goodness with Thelonious doing his best impression of that one really annoying mosquito you can't get rid of by slowly 
taking out the enemies one by one over the course of the next few rounds, making sure to not deal radiant damage since they reflect that. We do get bashed around a bit here and there, but without his soul pillars, Rafi can't really take us out in one turn, which means we can just heal up on our next one. It doesn't take us long to thin out the horde and leave just the devil himself. Thelonious goes full speedster with celestial haste, and we bet a fist of gold against Raphael's soul and prove we're better than him. Oh yeah, and Hope has a showdown with Yurgir, but he just gets yeeted out of the house and now he's someone else's problem. Hope is saved at last, and it's only fitting it was Thelonious that did it, proving himself a proper hero, for it is truly hope that he inspires with every speedy stride he takes. Besides just a storybook ending, we also get the gloves of soul catching as a reward, finally completing our super suit. These gloves increase our unarmed damage by 1d10 force, as well as let us regain 10 hit points per turn when we hit, or gain advantage on an attack roll or saving throw between when we hit and to the end of our next turn. It also boosts our con by 2, up to a max of 20, but thanks to our amulet that effect is pointless. And these will be replacing our bracers of defense that we got way back when, but with this amount of damage and healing we're well past needing the extra AC. Our rage against evil seems to have gotten the best of us there for a bit, so we decide to head to therapy before we take on the final fight. Well, here we get asked what our unspoken desire is, and <laughs> I mean, if we're being honest, it's gotta be this one. Our therapist seems to think that we mean it metaphorically, though, and also tries to recruit us to a cult. Oh god, why is it always a cult? What's a man gotta do to get some honest-to-god therapy in this city? Knowing that we're about to fight some shadow-stricken Sharans, we throw on our Heldosk helmet that we picked up earlier to make us immune to blindness. Alright, let's get this over with. There's a whole lot of them, but it basically just means we have to step of the wind disengage and get our punches in where we can each turn, before jumping to the opposite side of the room. Which forces all of them to dash as hard as they can every single round. The whole process gets sped up greatly once we use a scroll of cloud kill to deal some good AoE damage. Their leader Viconia goes down pretty fast, and with quite a few more murderous miasmas conjured up on these lackeys, we thin down the horde, and eventually punch the remainder when it seems that'd be faster. Well, you know, that actually was pretty therapeutic to dismantle one more cult for old time's sake. We sacrifice Viconia's shield to the altar at the end of the room to gain access to the employee-only room, wherein we find a cool-looking mirror back there, but before we head there, we head to a secret side passage to read up on what it does. Then we go chat with the mirror, and thanks to our reading, we get to skip the first check, and we make the second one easily enough. Once we make it, we get to take a temporary minus 2 to 1 stat in exchange for a permanent plus 2 to our dexterity, further increasing our most valuable stat, raising it up to a 22 and a plus 6 modifier. To get rid of the temporary loss, we just take a wee nap, and when we wake up, Thelonious has a hankering to beat up one final supervillain. We head straight down to the sewers where we find the netherbrain hanging out in all the stank water, preparing to make its move. It pulls us into its psyche where it reveals that this was its master plan all along, to gain control of Karsus's crown. And despite Despite the Lonius's best efforts, the stones don't do a darn thing. Before the big bad brain can finish us off, our tentacle teammate shows up and pulls us to safety just in time. While we regroup and re-strategize, our final foe begins to enact their perilous plan, plunging the city into chaos. Thelonious takes this opportunity to finally free Orpheus, causing the Emperor to immediately join the side of the villains, like he was just waiting for an excuse. Orpheus, however, is a bit more understanding and decides to join us as an ally for the final showdown, even taking it upon himself to transform into his most hated enemy so that he can wield the stones properly and defeat the brain. Now that's a hero. The two of us arrive just in time to see everything going to heck and back, as well as in time for this guy's speech to all of our friends we made along the way. Oh hey Withers. Then we charge headfirst into an actual army because we know even they can't stop us at this point. It doesn't take us too long at all to defeat said army either. With the army out of the way, we're in the home stretch. We just need to make it to the top, and since Orpheus can levitate, it takes him but a moment to get there, triggering the cutscene and teleporting us up as well. Before we climb the brainstock, we throw down a potion of invisibility on the both of us so we can skip any enemies that get in our way. We make the grueling ascent, with footage slowed down so the human eye can see Thelonious, of course, and once at the top, we creep up to the crown and use the stones to open up a portal. The moment we end Thelonious' turn, the portal opens up to the one place where we know we can take out the brain. It's Psyche. Once we're in, we throw down a potion of speed and a potion of flying, letting us zip down to Orpheus, who gives us fierce perilous stakes, granting an extra 15 psychic damage on each hit and also making it so we crit on a 15 or higher. You know what's next. Time for a good old fashioned pummeling. Hit and run, minus the run. And while we don't get the brain on our first round, it simply cannot keep up with Thelonious. But then again, who can? Our fellow superhero commands the brain to end itself once and for all, along with all illithid related threats that it's controlling. And just like that, the world is. Saved. But the world isn't the only one in need of saving. 
Orpheus can't stand his new form a minute longer and asks us to free him of it. Thelonious, however, sees hope. And with one last roll and one last nat 20, Thelonious saves just one more life. As any hero would. Thank you all so much for watching. Here's the stats for all three acts. I hope you all enjoyed Thelonious' heroic journey throughout Faerun. I had a lot of fun playing with this particular build and was surprised by just how powerful it ended up being. Stay tuned for a less than typical playthrough coming up next. Act 1 has been beaten already and it was a real doozy. As always, a special thanks to our Storyteller tier members here on YouTube, Bunny Warren, Player5, Damon, Larry Renzokuken, and The Big Yeet.